comfortable cages to go on the path of Allah. That's what our eminent Imam here has done. He left his comfort zone and went out to conquer the world in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wahaj has made statements in support of Islamic laws over liberal democracy. He also supports capital punishments such as stoning for adultery and was cutting off. <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is what I find from the internet. This is how the internet sometimes will, you know, that's how the internet will keep on, you know, sharing messages, you know, without, uh, without authenticating it. Yes. Without authenticating it. Yes. <laughs> Imam Siraj Wajhaj, currently the Imam of Masjid Al Taqwa in Brooklyn, New York, accepted Islam in 1969. Wahaj is well known among Muslims in North America as a dynamic speaker and tireless supporter of Islamic causes. Imam Wahaj, this is, listen to this, has been vice president of ISNA US since 1997 and has served on Majlis Ashura since 1987. He is a past member of ISNA's planning committee and has served as a member of the board advisor Board of Advisors of NAIT from 1989 to 1993. He's also a member of the Board of Advisors for the American Muslim Council. Imam Wahaj has appeared on several national television talk shows and interviews, especially about his anti-drug campaigns. He received high praises from the media and NYPDA. NYPD, this is the New York, New York uh, Police Department. New York Police Department. He's acknowledged in America for his causes for social justice and anti-crime, anti-drug within America. And has initiated anti-drug patrol in Brooklyn, New York in 1988. Imam Wahaj was the first person to give an Islamic invocation to the United States Congress. The first Islamic scholar to be invited to give an Islamic invocation. That's a milestone. He, I'm, I'm not going to you know, preempt uh, most of the things he will say himself, you will hear it from the horse's mouth. But the horse that is here is not, not, is not ordinary horse. He's one that has championed the Dawa movement all over the world. He is, continues to carry the light that our marhum Sheikh Ahmed Didat left us. He continues to carry that torch alight and spread it throughout the world. So please, brothers and sisters, now I invite to the podium Imam Siraj Wahai. Jazakullah <laughs> Khairat. Okay. Uh, um, can we use the roving mic, please? Um, I can use it right now. Yeah. How's the sound? Is it fair? Because I'm going to come out there at some point. Assalamu alaikum. I want to make sure the sound is okay. Is it okay? Bismillah rahman rahim alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salama ala rasulillah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I want to first say that I'm very grateful to Allah to have the privilege to address you uh, this afternoon for a few moments. Uh, where's the imam who was speaking while I was sitting? Where is it? Imam, I want to thank you. I um, really appreciate what you were saying. It was, it was very uh, exhilarating for me. I loved it. Uh, I, I, before I speak, I want you to look at this cameraman, right? I am a nightmare for camera people. Let me show you what I mean when it, when it gets over there. When it gets back over there, watch this. I want you to watch him, right? So when I speak, Look at him, see, see? I'm not gonna stop doing this. I'm gonna keep on doing it. Um, I, I wanna, I'm not gonna talk long, really. I'm gonna speak really for a few moments. Uh, I just want to uh, add something to, to this wonderful conference. I think that one of the most important things that we do ever is da'wah, 
really. I think that people take it as something that's not priority. It is the biggest priority. This work of Dawa is very humbling, extremely humbling, as you find out. Find out the difficulties that you have in giving Dawa, sometimes difficulty from Muslims and, and, and other people. And we're reminded that Allah said in the Quran, in the ahbabta walakin Allah man yasha. You cannot guide those whom you love. And I want you to think of the implication of the ayah. You cannot guide those. When you study the Arabic language, it's very precise. In English, if I say you, who am I referring to? I could be talking about one person, two people, a group of people, a woman. But the Quran is precise in the ka, masculine singular. You cannot go, who Allah speaking to? He's speaking to the prophet, peace and blessing be upon him, because the Quran is a context. It's not out of context. It's a context. Something is happening. Who's he speaking to? And when I read the Quran, I ask the question, you speaking to me? You speaking to me? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear who he's speaking to. He's speaking to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You cannot guide those whom you love. To my Abu Talib, his uncle, he's a mushrik. He's a mushrik. Those that you hate, a mushrik. You cannot guide those whom you love. So we Muslims, we, we, we forget. Some of us have family members. When I was Seven years old, I'm living in the projects in Brooklyn um, called Marcy Projects. Seven years old, Sunday morning, getting ready to go to church. And as I'm getting ready to go to church, I said this to my mother, and I want you to see the way I did it. I want you to see my body language. I like, I, why we got to go to church anyway? So I did to my mother, seven years old. She took out a belt. He said, Boom, boom. She said, now you understand? I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> About two, three months ago, I went to go visit my mother, 89 years old, and gave her shahada for my hands. Allah will humble you. All those years, inviting my mom until the light it goes on. If you study Hadith literature, you see in Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Allah will speak to Nuh, alayhi salatu wa salam. Hal balagta? Did you deliver the message? Yes. Ya Rabb, I, yes. Now Allah says something strange. He goes to his people. Did he, did he deliver the message? He said, no prophet came to us. Now, Allah does something extraordinary. He asks Noah, who will be a witness for you? I'm thinking Noah will say, well, uh, Allah is sufficient <laughs> as a witness. You know I, you know I gave 950 years. You know I did. So I asked, well, who can be a witness? He said, Muhammad wa ummatuhu. Muhammad and his ummah. And we will bear witness. Why Allah do that? It's to show honor to the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salat wa salam and the work that we're doing. I'm asking you the question, 950 years preaching. How many people accept it? They say maybe 80. 80 people. All those years, no one's crying. I've called my people day and night and public and private and 
And yet, who you think you are to think that Dawa is going to come just like that? Maybe one day they'll come in, in trails of people and come to accept Islam. But right now, we're going to be tested. We're going to be tested by people in our township. We're going to be tested by people in our, our neighborhood. We're going to be tested by people in our families. But we do da'wah for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and leave the results with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, I told you it's going to be a short talk. I'm almost finished. I'm, I'm going to come to my conclusion. Well, this is my first conclusion. If people listen to me, they know I have about three or four conclusions. So, so this is my first one. All right, don't go crazy. You know, um, I was in Norway a few years ago. And for the first time in the history of Norway, there are more atheists than Christians. Now, what I have done here, I have, um, I got some facts for you. I wrote it down because I, I wanted to make sure I remember them. Allah warns us, لا تكونوا كالذين ناس الله فأنسهم انفسهم. Do not be like those who forgot Allah. And therefore, Allah caused them to forget themselves. You have a big job. But yet your job is the most important job on the planet as far as I'm concerned. If you study what's going around around the world, this world is in trouble. Those who can see and understand and appreciate what's going on, you see that this world is in trouble. All over the world, you have crazy climates. In Australia, they had a fire that destroyed or deplaced, uh, displaced three billion animals. Fire caused by man. Floods, tornadoes, earthquakes all over is a sign. Something's going on and we have to hurry up. We have to hurry up to do this, to do this work, hoping that Allah is going to help us. Now, the West has forgotten Allah a lot. If you study a man named Arnold Toynbee, he was a British historian, probably the greatest historian ever. If you remind me, I'm going to read something that he said. Maybe I'll, I'll read it now. He's a non-Muslim, right? Albert Toynbee. Arnold Toynbee, listen to what he said. The solution to all international conflicts lies only in embracing Islam in mass. Because Islam is the only religion that can transcend nationalism. But listen to what he said. I see with great dismay that nationalism is gaining grounds even among the bearers of the Quran, I will hope for the day when all humanity will break this idol and unite all as the children of God. A non Muslim. He's no ordinary man, he's a master in history. And, you know, you can read his book, it's, it's a lot of pages, uh, millions of words, thousands of pages. If you want to, would you like to read it? sure you would. Let me share this with you, what's going on. Do not be like those who forgot Allah. And all over the world, you're saying that's the problem. Everybody doing whatever they want to do. But I'm a Muslim, and I'm not going to do whatever I want to do. I'm going to eat what Allah said I can eat. I'm going to drink what Allah said I can drink. Because I'm a Muslim. I'm a slave of Allah. I've never created the jinn and the humans except to worship me. Now you're Muslim now. We have obligation to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Listen to this. In Sweden, there are 4,515,000 atheists. 46% of the population atheists. Netherlands, 6,769,000 atheists, 40% atheists. United Kingdom, 
25,920,000 atheists, 40% of the population, atheists. Germany, 30,855,000 atheists, 38% of the population, atheists. Japan, 58,342,000 atheists, 46% of the population, atheists. China, 1,029,000,000 atheists, 75% of the population, atheists. But we got a problem. The problem is that we share this earth with everybody. 196,940,000 square miles. We share with everybody. We share with the atheists. We share with uh, 2 billion, uh, uh, 2 billion, 200 million Christians. We have them here. We shared with uh, 1 billion, 900 million Muslims. We share it. We shared one billion uh, 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 Hindu. We share with 500 million Buddhists, 15 million Jews, 16 million Jews, 17 million Jews. And all of us have to share this planet together. You as a Muslim want this uh, uh, earth to survive. You want it to thrive. You want it to be good. You want it to be healthy. And we, like everybody else, is in our interest. How many have heard of Albert Einstein? Raise your hand. Some of you are reluctant to raise your hand. You got a problem with Albert Einstein? Albert Einstein was a great scientist. He wasn't a Muslim. And he said something that really touched me. He said, the world will not be destroyed by those who do evil, but by those who watch and do nothing. Sounds like a hadith. That sounds like a hadith. The Prophet alayhi salat was salam. He said, uh, uh, he painted a picture of a boat. In the boat is good people and bad people. And the bad people begin to drill a hole in the boat. He said, if you stop them, you save them and yourself. If you let them go, you destroy them and yourself. Why? Because it's the same planet. We breathe in the same air. And if you have some fool in Russia to use atomic bombs, not only the people there will suffer, but everybody will suffer. So part of your job as a Muslim is not just to, oh yeah, we gotta be good, we gotta be good people. Yeah, yeah of course. Yo, no Kiyama, of course. But here right now, we make a difference in South Africa, for real. So the message that I wanted to leave you with um, this afternoon, this very short message, is that you as Dai, you are very special people, but you gotta be patient. You have to be patient. And the Prophet said, Let the first Thing you invite them to is the oneness of Allah. Don't worry about nothing else. Focus on that. Yeah, but Imam, they, 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 they doing drugs. I know you don't do drugs here, right? Oh, uh, you don't think so. Right, right, right. You know, you know what? You want to hear something, right? We, we're told uh, that we should um, call people Bil Hikmah. With, with wisdom, right? 1,400 years ago, they had an alcohol problem in Mecca. People were drinking. For 13 years, Allah never mentioned alcohol. He mentioned alcohol. 
فيكون عولا ما تدعوهم أن يوحد الله تعالى that the first thing you invite them to the oneness of Allah and when they get there he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabu to Yemen he's saying God he's, he's a da'i young man maybe 17 years old when he became Muslim استقبروا القرآن من أربع learn the Quran from four one of them Mu'adh ibn Jabu he sent them to do da'wah 13 years but so uh, and then when they when they do that then tell them they have to pray five times a day and when they pray they have to give zakat this is the order that the Prophet gave. Go study all the verses, Mecca, not one verse. It wasn't until they migrated a year or two later, the Khamra comes into play. But listen to how it's done. Allah doesn't initiate the conversation. Yes, Alunaka. <laughs> yes, Alunaka, Ya Muhammad. Yes, Alunaka, Ala Khamra, wa Maisir. They're asking you about intoxicants. I ain't saying it. I'm not mentioning it. Why are you asking? Because something is happening to your body now. You become a Muslim. They said, is this thing, is this, is this right? You know that stuff that you don't smoke, that other people smoke. Somebody have to one say, is this, is this legal? Is this the way I'm feeling? I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm supposed to be feeling like this. And then Allah said, well, you know, there's some benefit and there's some, and the harm is worse. But he didn't make it harm. Now these are Sahaba. Are they drinking alcohol? Some of them are. So they start drinking and they get stoned. I don't know if you use the word stone here. Stone, no? Huh? Okay, right. So one of the Muslims leaves a lot and he messes it up. So now what you're gonna do? Let taqru salat wa antum sukar hatta ta'lamu ma taqulun. Don't don't approach salat while you're intoxicated. Allah still don't make it haram. And finally, fetch tenibuhu la alikum tuflihun. Now leave it off. Now they're good because this what look what happens when that ayat is re revealed. Sahaba is drinking and they got the drink to their mouth. And they learn. Did they say, well, let me get one more? <laughs> Did they do that? Did they do that? Did they do that? No. They poured it out and the wine was in the streets of Medina like a river. Why? The order. Aisha radiallahu anha, our mother, she said, if Allah had first revealed, if Allah had first revealed, don't drink alcohol, the people would have said, we would never give it up. If Allah had revealed, do not commit zina, the people would have said, we would never give it up. Allah is wise. Can Allah order? He can order us. But our religion is not a religion of... Um, uh, uh, Commandments, thou shalt not do this, and thou shalt not do that, and thou shalt, no, 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 no. If you do that, the people will run from you. You're so busy telling them what they shouldn't do. Don't worry about what they're doing. Give them the essence, the essence, the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, let me tell you a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to conclude. Uh, I was in a, a college student. Uh, Right before I went to college, I, I remember I was playing basketball, by the way. Anybody here play basketball? Which is the best one among you who play basketball? Which is the best one? Huh? Oh, okay. So I just want to find out if there's any brother here who play basketball who would like to play me. You're too short. Come on, man. Yes? Yes? You play basketball? You want to play the chef? Let me ask you a question. I want to ask you a question. I want a real answer. If you played the shake, who do you think would win? Me or you? You? <laughs> I'm not talking to you about that. So, listen, I, um, I played basketball in college, right? And I was known for two things. A prolific defender. An outstanding shooter from far range. 
you brothers who play basketball, you know in the corner, for me in the corner is like a layup. Okay, you still wanna play me? <laughs> All right. So I was playing basketball in St. John's um, Recreational Center and they made an announcement, this 1968, they made an announcement that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Martin Luther King Jr. was the head of the civil rights movement. He was a man that I loved. Allah's my witness, I went home crying. And I remember saying, I'm either gonna be a black panther or a black Muslim. I'm gonna be either in response to the murder of Martin Luther King Jr., the one I loved, I'm gonna be a black Muslim or a black panther. And I read both newspapers. And I was in New York University, I never forget. I'm sitting in the, the cafeteria and the brothers from the Nation of Islam, they came and sat next to me. How you doing my black brother? You see, being in all the years in New York University, no, no Muslim, not one ever came to me and said, here's a pamphlet about Islam, about Muhammad, about the Quran, none. But the brothers from the Nation of Islam, they did. And it was like, it was like this. How you doing, my brother? And you know what that meant? That meant something. And there was a brother, Jerry Tenex, on the basketball team. I sat next to him, going to basketball games. And then I was invited to the temple. And the first, I, can, I remember the exact clothing I wore. 1969, I remember the shoes, the color of the shoes, the, the suit. And when I joined the Nation of Islam, I had a big afro. It was so big, you could land a helicopter on it. <laughs> no, I'm serious. Many helicopters landed on no. it. <laughs> so, uh, long story short, what was the appeal of the Nation of Islam? Black people oppressed. Nation of Islam addressed that, justice. And I joined the Nation of Islam that Wednesday night. I came back Thursday, uh, Friday the next time they had a meeting and I took some Muhammad Speaks newspapers. I have never sold anything in my life. That Friday night, I went on Eastern Parkway and Utica Avenue trying to sell Muhammad Speaks newspaper. I'm not a salesman. So I'll go to a person like this and say, um, I will say, you don't want this, do you? <laughs> what kind of sales technique is that? They said, no. So my point is the attraction of the nation of Islam, say what you want to say about the Akida, but the love for their people. The love of their people was extraordinary. Fighting, for fighting, fighting against injustice. Now, I need two volunteers, two brothers to come up forward. Two brothers. Huh? You stand here, and you stand there. Now, Ali knows that whenever I do this, I always ask these, but I have to ask you, do you know martial arts? You know martial arts? You know martial arts? You don't? You know how to fall? Yes, you know, how to, you know how to fall. Now, in the Nation of Islam, we had to sell, it's called Muhammad Speaks Newspapers. I used to sell a thousand a week. I quit my job. Why? For my people. This is my mind for my people. And I went projects by myself, a 25 cent newspaper, and I knocked on every door. I got a thousand customers. They learned to love me and I love them. They invited me soon. To, oh, Brother Jeffrey, come on in. Have a seat. And I had to say, I, I got to go now. But from home to home to home until I got over a thousand customers. One day, I'm walking down Eastern Parkway and I see a hallway and I said, okay, I'm going to go in there. I'm going to sell my newspapers. I used to knock on every door. And as I was about, about to go into the apartment, I saw two men standing in the middle of the hall. 
I said to myself, they're going to try to rob me. The guy to the right had a mean face like him. Right. And the guy to the left was more reasonable. Right. So I'm asking you, should I go in or no? I'm asking you, should I go in? Thinking they're going to rob me. Should I go in or not? Don't go. Go back. Go. You sure you want to, you sure you want me to do this? Right. So, so um, I went. The guy to the right who looked really mean, I took out a Muhammad Speaks newspaper. And I put it on his arm. And the other one, I put it on his arm. I said, now give me 25 cents. That's where we were because we had no fear. We feared nobody but Allah in our mind. The guy to my right, Wallah, he took out a gun. And he said, you just can't rob a Muslim. Put his gun back in his pocket and gave me 25 cents for the paper. And the same one here, he gave me 25 cents for the paper. See, that was easy, right? You good? You right? Let me ask you a question, right? Let me, let me ask you a question, right? How come your heart is beating so hard? <laughs> So why am I saying that? Say what you want to say about the nation of Islam. They didn't have the right aqidah, you're correct. They believed in a man named Father Muhammad is God. He's not God. They believed that Elijah Muhammad was a messenger of Allah. He's not a messenger of Allah. All of those things, right? We learned later. But the one thing the nation of Islam has that no Sunni Muslim group that I know have, they had what they call in the United States, cred. I don't know if you have that here called credibility. They had credibility. And they knew that the brothers from the nation of Islam, they take no mess from nobody. We were strong, we were together, and we were dedicated and we were committed. So I'm saying that alhamdulillah, 1975, Mr. Elijah Muhammad, he dies. And his son, Imam Walatha B. Muhammad takes over. Let me show you something about Allah. I was there. When Elijah Muhammad died, he died, and this is only by, by Allah's permission. Right? No one can die except by the permission of Allah. When Elijah Muhammad died, it was one day before our national holiday called Savior's Day. Why is that significant? Because that morning on the way to the airport, they told us Elijah Muhammad had died. We didn't know. And when I came, when we came there, big thousands of black Muslims, black Muslims. I'm sitting in security. Behind me are the speakers. I want you to see the picture, right? I'm sitting here, a roll of brothers in security. I'm sitting here behind us are the speakers. Why was that significant when Elijah Muhammad died? Had he died in any other part of the year would have been problematic to say the least. But all the leaders agreed that the new leader should be, at that time, Minister Wallace Muhammad, Elijah Muhammad's son, I think the seventh son, seventh child. And we all agreed that he would be the leader. We didn't know that first year he transformed us. My father, not the prophet, Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, the last messenger of Allah. Father Muhammad, not God, Allah is one, Wahid, and transformed, and I became Muslim, alhamdulillah. Malcolm X, if you read the autobiography of Malcolm X, how many read the autobiography? Recommend you read it, right? He left the nation of Islam in March 1964, and that year he made pilgrimage to Mecca. When he went to Mecca, he said he was embarrassed because they were making Salat, he didn't know how to make Salat. Six years, minister in the nation of Islam couldn't make Salat. We prayed, but we didn't make Salat. We stood up, this is how we prayed. We didn't make Sujood and Ruku, no, we did none of that, right? Malcolm said, he mimicked the people, whatever the people did, he did the same things. 12 years in the nation of Islam, no Salat. In the nation of Islam, we fasted, but we didn't fast in Ramadan. We fasted in December, Elijah Muhammad wanted to make it easier for his followers. So December, the days are short. So everybody, every year they fasted in, in December. 
But Imam Warthid Muhammad said, no, Shahr Ramadan. And he brought us Islam. And Alhamdulillah, now, today, since that time, 1975, we've been following the Quran and the Sunnah. Why I say that? Because there may be people today who are still in the nation of Islam. How you help to bring them? You can criticize them. You can beat them up. You can talk against them. But I choose something different. Not talk about them, but talk to them. I didn't come here to show you how to do nothing. Like what we're doing in New York and what we do in America. Nothing. But just to encourage you that this is great. This is what you're doing here. It's great. You discuss it. You talk about it. You digest it. And then you go out. Like to me, I, I, I love da'wah. I love da'wah. If you had a program, you say, Imam Sarad, we're going as a da'wah. We want you to come. I would have come. I would, but that's what I like. I like talking to the people. And you will see this. The constant dripping of water on a stone will drill a hole in the stone. Not a tornado or hurricane. Drip, drip, drip. And you will see that the people that you talk to make a difference. May Allah bless you. Don't give up. And, and don't be impatient. If you're going to be a da'i, you're going to have to be patient. May Allah bless you. Jazakallah khaira. And I'm sorry for... Um, Making you work so hard. <laughs> Shukra Jazakallah khair. Uh, our respected uh, Imam Siraj Wahaj for the powerful presentation. Um, I think after his presentation, I don't think I have anything to add. Um, it's so powerful, it's illustrative. So many examples, real life examples, drawing from his life, from the lives uh, of other eminent leaders in America, that us as youth, the leaders of Islam, we need to learn from. These are real life examples. If we don't learn from the examples of our elders, we are going to always grow up in the dark because we will not have the illumination we need in order to proceed with the Dawa movement. So let us take note of all the insights that have been shared by Imam Siraj Wahaj. At this moment, I will invite two or three questions uh, directed at our Imam, two or three questions and comments for those of you who feel that this message is relevant to the work that you are doing in your communities. Shukran. Okay. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum once again. Uh, my name is Saeed and I really want to appreciate the opportunity that we have been given and the uh, by the IPSI to be here today, as well as our honorable guest from overseas and everyone who is here. Uh, I would love uh, that uh, our honorable Sheikh to assist, assist us, to help us as people who are concerned about seeing Islam flourishing in this land. Because as we are all sitting here, I'm sure we are here because we are concerned. We want to see Islam flourish in the in the land, as well as yourself, Imam. Now, it's a question, and we need your assistance and guidance. The situation of the Uma in South Africa, it's like uh, people who have like a vehicle, like a car, let's say a car. The car has got different components, like wheels. Some people have got wheels in that corner there, Another one has got an engine there in the corner there. Another one has got seats in that corner. Another one has got a, a body of the car in the corner. But we all have aspirations to reach somewhere. All these organizations, I don't want to mention names. I made a mistake. I mentioned names when I was in the podium. 
So different different organizations, they have this zeal, you know, and the, 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 the intention that they want to see Islam spreading in the country, but they don't want to unite to have a common vision. By unite, I don't mean that uh, maybe they have to stay under one roof and become brothers by force and uh, no, but there is no one vision for the country. The Muslims of South Africa, especially those who are in institutions and those who are collecting resources, they are concerned about their organizations growing, but the really the concern about Islam taking over the country is not there. Now, for instance, a person like myself, I'm Zulu speaking, I am black also, and uh, I'm not anyone, I'm not important in any way, you know? And how do we convince all these boards and different boards of different organizations to come together, pull resources together and have one common vision, a one common five-year plan, one-year plan about Islam growing in South Africa? Because if we carry on like this, with all this division, another one has got a steering, another one has got wheels there, another one has got seats. We don't want to come together, pull our resources together. I'll make a typical example like a government. The government, there's one president. There are different ministers in South Africa and they've got different roles. Maybe take a simple example like the government, just simple example like a government to have one person who's gonna be, and then different departments. And then we have one goal that we want to see stuff. So I, wa I want to know how can we convince all our different organizations to come and have one goal and, and yeah, that's the crux of, of the question. Shukran, Jazakallah, Assalamu alaikum. Imam, Jazakallah khaira. I'm going to answer it this way. Muawiyah, radiallahu anhu, one of the companions of the Prophet said, La haqim ila du tajibah. There's no real wisdom without experience. Is your experience, Imam? I don't have the answer. You know the terrain. You know the air. You know the area. I will say this: You get a group of people who you trust, respect, and you go out there and you do the dawah. You see, they'll come to you. If the nation of Islam can come all throughout America and have a big, huge impact on African-Americans. Malcolm X, Muhammad Ali, Minister Louis Farrakhan, to some extent, Imam Siraj Wahaj, and a whole lot of others by themselves. Make effort, you try. Get to the different organizations. Let's have some talks, some conferences, some plans. But if they don't, you do it yourself. I ain't waiting for nobody. I ain't waiting for nobody for my people. I'm going to go with whatever resource we have. And we're going to do it. We're going to get our people. That's to be your attitude. And you know how people are? They see you successful, they're going to want to join you. You go out there, Imam. You go out there. I'll go with you. I'll come. You mind if I come with you? Allah Akbar. Thank you. Um, shukran Jazika. Uh, Imam, I think the next question is uh, Imam there. Imam. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, my name is Dawood Msimanga. Uh, I always had a dream. It's not a question, uh, but it's a, it's a request, you know. So I always had a dream. You know, I think for that dream to be true, the time is now. So my request is, please, when you go back to US, take me. To, and, and to go with you to the US. That, that was my dream, you know. So I think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, you know, made the time. You got a passport, you know, take me. Inshallah. <laughs> Uh, shukran, shukran, Imam Dawood. Um, that's a that's a beautiful one. <laughs> uh, 
Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Uh, I've got a question, Imam. Uh, you spoke about uh, the nation of Islam, and uh, as a young man, also I was somehow inspired by them. I used to listen. I still listen to Farrakhan until today uh, because uh, he puts me emotionally. He makes me see things differently, even though I don't agree with Akida. But my question is, um, since they have the Akira that they uphold, how is it that they are allowed to perform Hajj while they have that Akira? Uh, shukran. Um... Uh, it's a fair question. I've asked the same question myself. To be honest with you, I don't think that the people in Saudi know their true Akira. That's my answer. I, I don't. Because if you if you if you knew that, you couldn't. It's not it's not permitted. So I, I've always thought that, you know, that maybe the leaders hide what they really believe, their true aqidah. Because how can you say this man is God? If they don't let the Qadiani, Ahmadin, they don't let them make Hajj. Because they believe Gulam Ahmed is a prophet. Just that alone. And them more than that. So my, my personal belief, Allah knows best, but I personally believe that the people who invite them, they don't know. And we, I, I'll be honest with you, um, I know Minister Farrakhan very well. When he comes to New York, he called me, Imam, let's go for breakfast, let's go for dinner. I go to Chicago, we meet. And I'm always trying to encourage him. We had and uh, around the country called Dean Intensive Academy, where Muslims like myself would teach the members of the Nation of Islam with the approval of Minister Farrakhan. His top assistant, someone showed me a picture of Muhammad. Akbar Muhammad is his top friend, assistant, He's there, everyone Khan told me he wanted to take 10, because at this time they, they seem like they're changing. They're making salat, stuff like that, right? And, um, and try to facilitate it. But at that time, you gotta remember, Minister Farrakhan seemed to be changing toward the right. So I think that honestly, they don't know. My thing is to continue to encourage him and his community. Many of them are coming to Islam fully. And I don't like to say like Sunni Muslim. I, I understand, right? A Muslim. I became a Muslim in 1975. I became a Muslim. And, um, and again, uh, you listen, my dua for everybody to become, to become Muslim. And we try harder and harder. And if you get a man like Minister Farrakhan, he's so gifted. One million black men came to Washington, D.C. just to hear that man. One million. I don't know no one who can do that. No Muslim, no nothing can get a million uh, people to come to listen to him. He's that gifted. I think the most three gifted speakers in the history of African-Americans is Malcolm, Martin Luther King Jr., and Minister Farrakhan. So this is why I'm always making dua, Allah guide him to Islam. Amen. Fully, inshallah. Amen. Shukran. Shukran, Jazakallah, Imam. Um, one, more. one more question. Yes. He's very generous with us today. <laughs> One more question. Yeah, the last question goes to sister. Okay. No. Actually not a question, just some comments. Jazakallah uh, khair, Imam Sahib, you've done such a fantastic job in inspiring us and motivating us and advising us. It's so very badly needed in South Africa at the moment because we're not in a good place in terms of poverty levels, crime, uh, natural disasters even, and uh, we've got power outages and things like that, also politically very divided as well. So we need a unifying uh, force. And I think the answer is Islam. And that is why we have to intensify our dawah efforts. Yeah. Otherwise, we're not going to make it here in South Africa, especially the minority groups. So even Muslims, we in a minority, 
so race wise, we are in the minority as well. So we're vulnerable, but I feel that Islam, Dawah is the solution. I like that. Inshallah. Thank you so Make much. Make dua for us. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Jazakallah. Salam. Uh, shukra, Jazakallah, sister. Um, okay, one last question. One last question. Uh, you can stand, brother. We want to capture you on television. I think your mom can see me, mashallah. Now, uh, my your, ne is... your name, your name, oh, my name, my name is Nasir, Nasir Mirazi, right? Shukra. Just uh, right. what I actually had a few things prepared to actually ask with regards to barriers of inviting or being a die to Islam, but I'll just ask one from my mom that how do you guys actually? overcome the barrier of uh, Islam being hampered in the sense that normally here in South Africa, we have the problem where people normally give people things in order to invite them to Islam. Maybe we can look at a different strategy from your side. And also, obviously, the common one would be racism as well. And I think everybody in every country, every locality understand the people of their territory more than anyone else. So I'm saying, let, 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 let keep. So what I'm saying is that I, you have to use the methodology that you think is best. If it's giving them something, okay, then you do it, right? Um, if it's, um, let, let me tell you, let me tell you something I did. <laughs> something I did, it's, it's off now. Is it off? I can't hear it. You know, it's about your boldness. One day, I was in the Nation of Islam, and we had lieutenants, like security, Lieutenant Richard 8X. We, with the X's, but I was Jeffrey 12X, which meant I was the 12th Jeffrey in New York to, be, to join the Nation of Islam. Jeffrey 13, and I know him, he's the next Jeffrey that came. Malcolm X in Detroit was the first Malcolm in Detroit, so it was Malcolm X. Malcolm 2x, 10x, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So they, the, I, I told him, the, the, the lieutenant, I said, lieutenant, one day, I think it was a Saturday, I said, can you get me a bus? He said, what do you mean a bus? I said, I want a bus. So they knew I was like a little crazy. So he got me a bus. And he said, where you go? I said, I want you to drive around. We drove around, it's a true story. We drove around and I saw a park with some people. This is what I want. Islam is the solution. About 13 of them got in the bus. And we took them to the temple and taught them. So you have to figure it out. If it means giving them something, Give them something. Okay, I don't know your, the methodology that you use, whatever you think is best for you. Um, but the thing is, your, your own niya and the effort that you make. You can have nothing except for what you strive for. And my, my, I don't think that's the case here, but in most of the places, people don't care. They don't care about no dawah. They don't spend no time in no dawah. They can care less about the people. But when you have this intention, you really love the people, Allah help you. You find a way, whatever it takes. You call me, said Imam Sarad, we need so and so. I talk to my friends in America. I try to give you what you need to help you to do that because I know you're sincere and you really want the people. So um, listen, may Allah bless you. I, you know, you cannot, you cannot measure the, the love I have for you. You can't. It's impossible. You think I like you. Yeah, I like you, but I really love you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Salik. Uh, shuk shukran, Jazakallah, <clears throat> Imam Siraj Wahaj, uh, for the powerful you know, illustration of all the weapons that we need at our disposal.
in order to push the DAWA movement forward. Um, we have been charged today to come up with a methodology and an action plan. Uh, so this phase now is for the way forward. Um, we need to come up with a way forward for the DAWA movement in South Africa using the tools, using the insights that have been shared by our respected scholars and our respected DAI here this morning. Um, some of the core activities that IPCI has been implementing are here. I just want to go through so that we can look at where we are failing uh, so that some of the insights that have been shared today can be fed into our strategy and improve the work that IPCI has been doing. So one of our activities is the educational programs. We conduct a range of formal and informal educational programs aimed at different groups of people. So the main objective is that we want to impart skills, not welfare handouts, not social grants, but skills. This is a developmental aspect of the work of IPCI that Marhum Sheikh Ahmed did it, left for us. So we need to continue conducting educational programs that are going to create productive individuals, productive communities. Because without creating productive communities, people will be dependent on us. People will be dependent on the state. We want to charge people with their God-created agents and creative abilities. Each one of us is uniquely gifted. The reason why we focus on educational programs is that we want to ignite that creative ability that is in each one of us. So the second, the second activity is um, we are also doing, uh, there are some work that we are doing with the IPCI Learning Academy. So there are comparative religion classes that we conduct here on Saturdays. Every Saturday we have comparative religion classes. We have students from um, IDM, Nam Asalam, that are here every Saturday that are attending these uh, classes. And also we have school.